with tonight uh, with the uh, discussion over the repeater going, we only have one presentation tonight. Uh, but before we do that, if anyone has and utilizes or just utilizes a Yezu 991, who was it that needed Doug. the mic assistance? Doug, yes. please reach out to Mr. Doug. Raise your hand again. Anybody uh, have a 991 that can help out somebody? Jeff. Got one. Jeff Young. Who? Jeff Young. AK4GY. Oh, Jeff Krause. Oh, Jeff Krause. 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 Jeff so hopefully, out of some of those names, we could, we'll get you in touch with somebody. Anyway, uh, tonight we have a Skywarn presentation, and uh, I'll hand it over to you, Mr. Baker. Oh, oh, before I do that, the little, what are these called? QR, QR. QR codes are on the thing, but they're still blowing my mind. You can make a picture of this and go to the link. I'm very simple minded. Um, there's these things all over the place that takes you to the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Survey. Signal. Survey. Yes. Signal report. I was like, no, no, it's another S word. Signal report <laughs> for uh, how the meeting went. Please don't dog me too hard. I'm kind of new here. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, you're going to see some more QR codes just going to one at a time. Uh, I want to thank you for coming out. Uh, I, I realized on the way over here, I don't have a slide that says, you know, what this is about. And, uh, but basically, the title says it. It's Skyward in 2024. How does that change? Or how has it changed from what we have thought about the Skyward being like, you know, for the past 30 years? So we're going to go through some of the changes on that. So. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip to this part. Let's just say I, I was a kid in the 70s. And I was a weather nerd. This had a lot to do with it. And I was a radio nerd. I actually got the, the Motorola there. Oh, that was, that was my dream. I got to actually sit on a, on a stake out at that corner uh, as a 10-year-old. I'll have to tell you about that if you're interested sometime. We're going to move on. Uh, I've been in the weather service since 1992. I started out in Concordia, Kansas, in the north central part of the state. Went to uh, Norfolk, Nebraska in 1994. Um, it was at Norfolk, Nebraska that I first saw in the weather service a two meter Kenwood amateur radio. And that's that year that I got there, it was uh, very quiet weather wise. So we didn't have any operators come in, but I was exposed to ham radio at that point. And in 1995, I got my license, uh, technician, no code. Uh, drove down to Omaha and got that. Uh, then in 1996, moved to San Angelo, Texas. Very active Skywarn program there. Uh, two meter UHF analog nets. And we, uh, we had some repeater linking that we did with uh, Abilene. And so I've been a ham since the uh, mid 90s. Uh, moved to Memphis, Tennessee in 2006. And uh, seems strange to say, but I've been here for the better part of my career, which is uh, uh, 30 years uh, next month, it's hard to believe. Um, so anyway, we'll move on. Uh, at the National Weather Service in Memphis, this is our warning and forecast responsibility area. It covers four states, uh, 55 counties, uh, 2.7 million people, and about 1.1, give or take, of those million people live in the Memphis metro area. So we do have to interface with state governments, you know, you know, four of them. So it does add a little bit of complication uh, to the uh, to the forecast sometimes. For example, the state of Tennessee, where would you get a hurricane up here uh, that was still a tropical storm? We would not be using any tropical weather headlines for Shelby County. So that's just a little bit of trivia at the request of the state. So we issue warnings for the, the products you see here on the right. Uh, the products that are highlighted in white are what we uh, typically associate with Skywarn. So we'll have uh, obviously the tornado, severe thunderstorm, and flooding. Uh, also winter weather. Uh, we're very interested in that in real-time reports. Uh, winter weather being kind of a, a somewhat uh, rare occurrence around here. So. 
uh, those rare weather phenomena are sometimes more difficult to forecast. So we like to know how we're doing. So the WSR and AD radar, uh, we all have seen radar on phones, and you'd be surprised at the amount of infrastructure that brings that to you. Uh, this is an S band uh, radar of 10 centimeters. Transmitting at 750,000 watts. And it has a variable pulse repetition frequency uh, depending on what we're trying to look at, what kind of uh, velocities we're, we're interested in. And uh, we can also vary the pulse length. So if we're looking at snow, uh, we can get a, a you know, better uh, sensing of that. This is a 28 foot diameter dish. Uh, this 3 dB beam width on this dish is less than one degree. So almost 46 dB of gain. So this would make quite an EME antenna. You'd have, to, you'd have to aim it very carefully to get it. But about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, we added dual polarization capability to the radar. So that allows us to discriminate between different types of precipitation. Uh, not even precipitation, maybe debris, like leaves, shingles, things like that, are lofted in the air from, uh, from tornadoes. So this dual polarization necessitates that we have two waveguides on here. So there's a lot of mechanical upgrades that had to uh, support dual pole. So normally, radar, weather radar is horizontally polarized, and that's due to the fact that raindrops, unlike the the conceptual models that we all have, like a raindrop is like a teardrop shape, they're actually, when they're falling, they're more like a pancake, they're more oblate. So they're a little bit wider than they are tall, just due to the, uh, to the air friction. So that's the way we've oriented the electrical part of the uh, electromagnetic wave, is horizontal. Well, dual pole keeps that, and then also the falling pulses, they're vertically polarized. So uh, they're interleaved, I'm not sure at what rate, but given that uh, we can see that the hail, which tends to be more round shaped, I, I gave you the shape of rain, the snow tends to fall flat as well, just like the raindrop does, but even to a greater extent. So when we're seeing the uh, precipitation echoes on radar, we can tell if it's rain or snow. We can see what the melting layer is. So that has great impact on rainfall estimation, uh, even for aviation. So melting layer could be hazardous to fly through for icing. So I put a QR code here. Uh, if anyone's interested, there's no sign-in required. You can get the, uh, it's not really training, it's more of like, how does dual pole work? What's, what's the advantage of polarizing the radar signal one way and then doing it the next way, uh, next, uh, you know, vertically? So that would be a, a good resource there, and I'll have these at the end of the presentation as well. But this will allow you to kind of get an idea of why, why even go through the trouble and the expense of uh, dual pole. So these, these two panels here at the top, this is what we've had since the advent of Doppler weather radar. We've had the, the uh, WSR 88D here in uh, Memphis and Millington since 1995. So it's, it's been around for a while. But we've had a lot of computer upgrades because this radar puts out a lot of data. It's digitized very early on. And then the computers, the radar products generator, goes through and does all of its math. And there's a lot of math. You see each one of these little blocks here, these are called range bins. And there is a lot of calculations that go on each one of those range bins. Before we had dual pole, we could see reflectivity. We could see the hook echo and, and infer that now yeah, there's some circulation there. There's probably a tornado. With the advent of Doppler radar, we could see the radar is up here to the top of the screen. We could see that there's some circulation going on here. We could actually measure the velocity. So you have strong inbounds next to strong outbounds. And a lot of us are, are familiar with this green, green and red here. So as long as this corresponds in location to this hook echo, we can be pretty reasonably assured that there's some strong circulation going on there. And a little teaser, the radar is not, see, what? Have to, the radar is not sensing the tornado. But we'll get to that in a minute. So with dual pole, 
we have a, a couple of new products here. We've got several, but I'm just showing you the two here. This is called ZDR, or uh, Differential Reflectivity. Basically what it's saying, am I seeing more return power coming back in the horizontal signal sent out the pulse, or am I getting more in the vertical? And if this number is positive, it's going to be more in the horizontal. If it's more vertical, it's going to be in the negative. And if it's near zero, then it's a mixture of both. And it could be debris. So just imagine you've got a lot of shingles, a lot of leaves flying around in the air. If you took the average shape of those over time, they're going to average out to pretty much circular. So we, we see corresponding with the soot echo and a couplet near zero on the ZDR. And then how many of, how many of y'all heard of the tornado debris signature? So we'll look, sometimes we'll put a warning, right? Uh, tornado confirmed by radar. Go, you go back here. <laughs> Still getting used to this. Okay. That's what this feature is here. So uh, this is called correlation coefficient. What that lets you determine is how much variability am I seeing in each one of these little range bands here. So if it's really high, like 0 0.9, this darker reddish purple, that means I got a lot of the same size returns coming. So it could be a lot of hail and just nothing else mixed in with it or a lot of rain or a lot of snow. But if I got a lot of variability here, that means I've got a lot of different stuff. It could be trees, it could be shingles, it could be, you know, who knows whatever. A tornado could lock this uh, in the air. And I keep hitting the wrong button, I apologize. And that's what we call the, uh, the correlation coefficient. So now we get a lot of this on the radar. You see a lot of uh, uh, people on the internet and social media saying, oh, there's a tornado debris signature, there's no warning. Well, it has to be airily correlated with these other signatures. It can't be out here in the middle of nowhere. You're going to have a low CC sometimes with those really low reflectivity. So you kind of have to match it up. Okay, so I said earlier the radar cannot see tornadoes. What's, what it is actually measuring is the mesocyclone. And that's just a fancy word for a rotating updraft. And that's up here at altitude. You can imagine with the Earth's curvature and the radar, the lowest elevation is 0 0.5 degrees. So that beam is going to climb in altitude with distance. So here in Shelby County, we've got really good coverage. Down in Clarksdale, Mississippi, not so much. So as that radar beam climbs in coverage, what else does it do? What does a flashlight do the further out in distance you go? It gets weaker and it gets wider. So even close in, like at Shelby County, a tornado's diameter is going to be much larger than the beam width. So it can get lost inside of that, that beam. So what, what it's actually measuring is the mesocyclone. And we can, infer, we can infer that if this mesocyclone gets strong enough, there's probably a tornado we just don't know. So that's why we need spotters. The radar can see this. Uh, this mesocyclone here, the green is, is uh, cloud elements moving toward the radar, and red is red's moving away and green is toward. And as I mentioned before, the radar can see, they can see a tornado free signature if debris here on the ground gets lofted high enough to where it crosses the beam center line. But what we need spotters for is to tell us what's going on here on the ground. So you can see the cloud base visually, assuming there's no trees or hills, which is a challenge in the Mid-South. You can see if there's a wall cloud here, and importantly, is that wall cloud showing signs of rotation? And if it is, is anything down here on the ground trying to hook up or, or respond to that cloud base circulation? If it, if it is, you've, you've got a connected circulation and you've got a tornado. That is something, especially on these smaller circulations, the radar is just not going to see. Unless you're very close to the radar and don't have, uh, well, DMIM is a little bit lower. We can see these smaller scale features moving into Memphis, but not so much on NQA. 
I think I have a white slide here. Let's see. No. Okay. So traditionally, the Sky One program, we had formal training. Spotters would get a certificate. We do this through the spring and sometimes in the, in the fall. And our spotters would communicate over ham radio, which is usually two meter FM, uh, sometimes UHF, sometimes uh, maybe the repeaters would be linked together, probably not. And we, the NWS, the blue box there, we would issue the watches and warnings and we would be in contact with the media through the phone. Uh, emergency managers as well. Media do a great job in communicating with the public and our emergency managers also communicate with the public. They, you know, they've got their hands full down in Florida, certainly this week. This is how we did it back in the day. The public was welcome to come to the spotter training meetings, and a lot of the members of the public would take this formalized spotter training. You could kind of put them up there in that red box. So over the past couple of decades, what has changed a lot, and I, I think you could boil this slide down to one thing, and that's social media. But we, we've seen the communication channel over the, the Skyward network, the, the two meter repeaters, get a little bit less and less, and then social media has really, really taken over. So we get a lot of direct communication. This, this channel here has gotten very, very thick. We get a lot of information back and forth with social media. Sometimes, oftentimes, not the best quality information. We have to sift through it. And like we've seen with, you know, recently, sometimes you hear rumors and, and things that just aren't true. And so we do have to go through that. And when we do get storm reports from the public, you know, we do have to quality control that. Uh, we, we've gotten new management at the Weather Service here in the last couple of years. And with any new manager that comes in, it's like, well, look, what do we got here? You know, what are we expending our resources? Where are we getting our reports from? And so these reports were were undertaken, and we found out that while we're getting a lot of this, a lot of bang for the limited bucks we have right here, and not so much here, and our neighbor to the east, uh, NWS Nashville moved over to a weather safety training in which we tried to interact more with the general general public while still providing some some kind of like spotter light quote unquote training. Uh, still still some storm spotting techniques, some some technical stuff for more advanced spotters, but primarily it was it was tailored towards the public. And I apologize, I keep hitting the wrong button. So the weather safety training, we no longer hand out these report or these uh, these uh, certificates, you know, that you're a certified spotter. But we do still encourage people that do attend the weather safety training, you know, say so that you know we are, you know, let's, I'm a I've been your spotter training. Um, for those that want to, to delve a little bit deeper into meteorology and how to spot, there is online spotter training options that you can take. So basically, that's that's what's changed over the past uh, couple of decades, even since I've been here in Memphis, 18 years. Uh, I went back through some of our documentation, and I just couldn't believe how much formality and, and for lack of a better word, bureaucracy there was. Uh, we had formal training, not just for our spotters, but for the folks that came out to the weather office to man the radio, they had to have formal training. We also had Skyward districts throughout our 55 county area. These districts, they had coordinators and they had meetings and they have, there's just a lot going on. We still have some of this today. It's a little less, I don't want to say a little, we're trying to be a little bit more accommodating to people's time. Uh, we had a uh, Skyward liaison, a local liaison committee, and that's, that's where we do our planning through. So, uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, as I mentioned, society has changed in 20 years. Uh, a good deal of this is down to social media, the internet. People will be able to post, uh, post photos of storm damage online. Some of it directed to us, some of it we have to go dig for and find ourselves. 
Um, but it does take a little bit of an effort. On the amateur radio side, you know, 2 meter FM is, has been joined by the digital modes, V Star, VMR, Fusion, and, and P25, and, and of course there's more. There's just a lot, from a hobbyist point of view, in amateur radio, there's a lot to go and explore. And so I think perhaps one of the downsides of that is it's kind of pulled some people away from the FM side that we kind of, you know, if you've been out of the hobby for 15 years, you come back and turn on the repeater, it's like it's not as active as it used to be. I, I think people are still on the repeaters, but they may have got a digital mode that you don't have access to at the moment. Uh, certainly, HF Solar Cycle 25 is a big deal, and that's going to be a lot of fun for those with the, uh, the license privileges. And so I think that may be one of the reasons why the repeaters are quiet. Not that that's a bad thing, it's just uh, something that I've noticed. On the social, you said sometimes y'all got to hunt for it. Is there a preferred, you know, way to, to send it to you that, that, that works or? Yes, yes, and I'll, I'll get to that. Get, get to that. Okay. You, you can you. certainly send a direct message to us on, on Facebook or Twitter or X, whatever it's called. So um, we also have a website. For those that don't want to do social media, I understand. We, we've got a, a, a method or a channel for that too. <coughs> So I don't want to. I don't want to look back at the old days and you know, man, those were great days. I wish we could do that again. They weren't always that great. Um, I remember this was at uh, an issue at San Angelo too. We would uh, would have severe weather coming in Abilene, Texas, and it's like, oh, we need to we need to activate. Well, it turns out the repeaters weren't linked up, and some of us knew how to do it, some of us didn't, and maybe sometimes the linking wasn't successful, and uh, we had limited coverage. On the repeaters, so let's just put it that way. And sometimes we had a hard time getting, you know, people coming into the office. Like it's at 2 30, and, and our net control operators, you know, would send out an email. It's like, well, as soon as they could get out to the office, it'd be maybe 4 30 after work, and the storms weren't going to wait that long. And uh, understandable, we, you know, we all have commitments. Um, Sometimes we would get a net control operator up to weather office in and, and San Angelo or Memphis and he or she'd just be sitting there sometimes for most of the evening. And sometimes storms would develop, sometimes they wouldn't. We've all been through tornado watches that didn't turn into anything. Or they may affect Northeast Arkansas and the boot hill and we had no way to reach up there with RF. So we had to send them home after a while. So we had some downsides then too. So uh, going to 2018, Skyward meets DMR. And that's what this talk is about. Uh, the Memphis, uh, NWS Memphis talk group was uh, started by uh, Keith Franck, WX4EMT. And the, the network, uh, without going into too, far, too many details, DMR is a digital digital mode and repeaters, hotspots can be linked over the internet through a network. There's a number of DMR networks out there. DMR, Mark, there's, I won't go through them all. Brandmeister is the most uh, popular one and Brandmeister was chosen because they allow and welcome the usage of hotspots. And not, not all of the uh, networks do. They're tailored for different different uses. DMR, Mark gives, you know, absolute power to the repeater operators if you're in, in uh, Chicago and you want your your 10 repeaters linked together and you only want local traffic well that's what you got and Brandmeister is more open so it allows us to uh, anyone around the world if they wanted to if you're on vacation even on a cruise with internet you could monitor our Skyward route through a, a Brandmeister hotspot so our flagship repeater at the time was W4 uh, LAT, just north of Shelby Farms. And uh, so Keith Rock and, and the liaison team came out and had a demonstration. And I, I at that time, I had not even heard of DMR. I thought, was this D-Star or what is it? He goes, no, it's DMR. So uh, it was very, uh, it was quite a new thing to me. And, and uh, so I went up and got a, uh, a radio here. Uh, this is... This is at my house, but this radio, this radio is going to be moved out to the NWS office in Memphis here soon, as soon as I can do the program. 
So this is what a hot spot looks like. I'm not showing y'all anything here that you haven't seen. That's the hot spot that is at the, uh, at the AWS office currently. So with the advent of EMR, uh, we have a, uh, a chat system that is reserved for ARIES members and emergency managers, media, other meteorologists, uh, private and uh, weather service. Uh, it's called NWS Chat. We moved to Slack a couple of years ago. And with that, the net control can be anywhere. So EMR does allow us some flexibility in how these nets are structured. On the left is a multi-tier. This is, this is a, a rather formal type of net structure. Maybe, I don't know, maybe on a very active weather day, a high risk tornado day. Maybe the folks down in uh, Oxford want to run their own net and then they could you know, contact the net control on, on, on the NWS Memphis top roof and the net control. It does not have to be in Memphis. Can uh, you know communicate with the weather service through Slack? Or a more simple uh, net structure just be single net control and hands all over the mid south. This is what we've see see the most often by far. So a little bit of technical things about the NR uh, EMR. Most of y'all know this is a uh, a TDMA technology. Uh, if any, anyone remembers the original iPhone, um, well, actually, it was the, the one that preceded uh, 3G. So that was a, T, a TDMA technology. So you've got two time slots here that are interleaved. So uh, this is kind of a blown up uh, representation of that upper graph there. So every 30 milliseconds, you've got, you've got a payload here, you've got a guard time, and then the next. Next time slot starts. So the end result is this. You can have two people on the repeater at the same time. Most of y'all uh, know about this. So I'm not going to spend any more time on that. One of, the, uh, one of the caveats of that, and I didn't know about this. I still haven't seen too much about it. Uh, there's a YouTube presentation I've got a link to here. There's a, a Motorola group out of Seattle, Washington. And they said that one of the things they found out is this, this rise time with TDMA, the timing is very important, and the repeater is the master controller of the time. And Dan probably knows a lot more about this than I do. But this is the DMR spec here. This is the uh, your radio's amplifier ramping up. It has to fit in this these coordinates here within the DMR spec to get that pulse out. So these pulses are only 30 milliseconds long. And there's guard time, a little bit of dead space between the, the two time slots. And if you're out on the fringe and you're talking to someone that's close in and you got a little bit of clock drift on the radios, the Motorola folks there in Seattle found that the effective range, and this give or take, 40 to 50 miles. So if you had a, a Yang you put up on a tower and you want to talk to Jonesboro, you might get into the repeater if it were FM. You may get a little bit of signal, but the repeater is going to say your timing's off. That time slot already left the station, so you won't logically make make it in. So just something to just something to consider. I don't think that's going to be any problem around the metro area here, and we're going to have a lot of repeaters that we're going to look at here shortly. Uh, there's a lot of choices amongst DMR radio, radios. This is the new Anytone uh, 168 that was just uh, announced. It's $200 new. Got a lot of neat features on it. Over here on the left is the uh, couple of Motorola's uh, 7550E and the new R7 that replaced it. And we, we just heard about the Motorola repeaters. Uh, the one thing the Motorola's have going for them and the high shares as well. On the RF side, they're very high performance, very sensitive, uh, very rugged. But this is where DMR's commercial background really shows through. There's not much front, 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 front panel programming on these radios. They're not quite as ham, ham friendly. You'll get a, a zone number and a channel number here that you see. Over here on this Anytown side, a VFO, you actually see the frequencies. So that's one hand friendly aspect right there. Another one is these, I just advance again, these radios here tend to be 
uh, nowadays dual band. So you got UHF and VHF, so you have flexibility. Now most of the DMR repeaters around are UHF. I found one on the Grandmeister network uh, down in Aberdeen, Mississippi, that's uh, VHF. So there are exceptions, uh, not, too, not too many of them. Um, these are designed for a commercial environment. So they're designed, if you can picture a factory floor with a lot of ambient noise, you need to get out there and you communicate with your, you know, whoever, your team, very loud speaker, and they have noise cancellation, so the person on the other end is not gonna hear all that factory noise in the background. I've seen these things demonstrated with a lawnmower, you can barely hear the lawnmower because the active noise uh, cancellation in the background. So they are made for commercial environments. They're not, they're not uh, at all inexpensive new, but you can get those new for three or eight hundred dollars. I just picked those numbers off, give or take. Uh, depends on the uh, condition that you find and use. Uh, the R7's newer, so that's going to be the most expensive. These are about fifteen hundred, eighteen hundred new, mm -hmm. something like that. They are not cheap. Uh, one last feature. If you don't have, the way DMR works, if you don't have the, the uh, call group program into the repeater, you may not be able to listen to it on these Motorola's. You may have to take it back home, plug it into your laptop, your CPS, and add that call group on there. The Indy Tones and a lot of the other uh, more amateur friendly radios will have what's called promiscuous mode of the DMR spec. Uh, any time it calls it digital monitor mode, so you're actually able to listen to any time slot, that's any traffic that's going on there at the moment. And if you decide you want to listen to it, you know, you know, communicate with them, you can. Uh, the Motorola doesn't offer that. You can imagine if you're in a, a commercial setting and you're on the factory floor, you shouldn't be able to listen promiscuously to the manager's talk group. So you kind of understand why, you know, where Motorola is coming from and where the, uh, the amateur, these manufacturers have kind of adapted that towards amateur use. So there, I mentioned the RF side, the Motorola does have uh, quite a bit better uh, specifications as far as sensitivity. Uh, if you're in a noisy RF environment, uh, working on a repeater side or downtown Chicago, this, this will do a better job than that. Than the cheaper radio. But for most of us, this is going to be just fine. One thing common to all DMR radios is CPS software. This is going to vary by manufacturer, the menus here, but uh, one of the things that the takeaway that I found is there, there's a lot of extraneous, you know, this is where the commercial side comes in. Uh, there's a menu here for renting, so you know, you could rent out your, your high terror radio to someone and it'll work for you know, a set period of time. Obviously, not something we're interested in here in, uh, in radio. We don't use encryption on the air, a lot of things like that. So I think part of the challenge of the customer programming software is trying to figure out the stuff that you don't need. And uh, again, you see the you know commercial heritage coming through just with the Navy uh, customer. So I mentioned uh, W4 LET. Most of us know that W4 LET has been decommissioned. And we had a talk here uh, last month, Dan spoke about that. Uh, this was a Cadillac of the DMR repeater. Uh, very wide coverage, and a lot of that due to the Motorola uh, repeater and this antenna height, almost 600 feet AGL, uh, just north of uh, Shelby Farm. So uh, this has been decommissioned since uh, July of this year. And we've got a new repeater, just a little bit north of the uh, LET location, uh, W4EF by the Mid-South Amateur Radio Association. I'm not sure about this flat map here, uh, how, how accurate it is. You see the antenna height is, uh, is considerably lower at 151 feet. But, uh, and like I said, I haven't gotten, gotten around to programming my radio yet, my uh, code plug. But, uh, Thanks to the, to the folks there at the bar, we've now got, you know, DMR capabilities continuing in the Mid-South. And as we just, before I got up here, this is last month, I was not able to attend a meeting, but uh, 
if you're interested in, in the, the background of, of moving the uh, 143 700 repeater over the DMR, I highly recommend uh, watching Dan's presentation. So uh, this QR code or pick you right to that point immediately. So more QR codes. So I was going to show splat maps of all the, the DMR repeaters around the Mid-South that are on the Brandmeister network that also have a static link to NWS Memphis stump group. There's quite a bit. And so I just thought I'd consolidate that down into one graphic here. And all of these with the exception of maybe one are statically linked to NWS Memphis stock group. So Wyville, Somerville, we see the new repeater here in Memphis, got Marion. Uh, last week I was talking to some uh, to a club down in Oxford. They're interested in putting up a repeater, getting their new repeater going again uh, with the talk group. That would, that would give us some much needed coverage down in Mississippi. I'd like to see us get one of the two below. Uh, but right now it looks like this uh, Aberdeen repeater down here. This is VHF. So that's the, that's the one. Now the takeaway from this is even if the repeater is not statically linked on one of the time slots to this uh, NWS Memphis talk group, you can do so. You can dynamically link it, which means you could, you know, so if there's no traffic on that time slot currently, you can listen in on the net, uh, set the repeater uh, dynamically to listen. Most repeaters, after about a 10 minute timeout of inactivity, will drop the talk group. Or if you send it a 400, uh, you know, top group 400, it'll, you can disconnect. This slide is courtesy of Michael Knight, uh, KK4 IOH from last year. I don't know about the status of the All Star linking to the AWS Memphis repeater. This is just to show that uh, technically it can be done. So, folks that don't have DMR radios, uh, don't have any plans to get one, uh, I know in 2023 we had some uh, folks in Jonesboro that actually called in on the net with an analog radio uh, to the DMR talk group. So this linking can be done from a technical point of view. So I would defer to Michael Knight for any uh, you know update on this, but uh, we do have a DMR repeater in Jonesboro now, so they can get into the talk group directly. So I'm going to talk real quickly about storm spotting challenges here in the Mid-South. I'm not going to get into any, any technical spotting techniques, other than to say it can be really hard. Uh, we have a lot going for us. We're not going to have any, any chaser uh, TV shows uh, here in the Mid-South unless they're driving. You know, I've seen a few driving around Memphis, but that, that's, it's really hard. We've got a lot of hills, we've got a lot of trees. One of the problems we have this time of year, the earlier sunsets, we get a lot of fast moving storms at night. And it's just impossible to spot. It's just it's just not easy. And uh, here in Memphis specifically, we do have some problems with some urban flooding. I saw this on Facebook a couple weeks ago. My professor uh, posted it. I'm not sure what the state of Iowa did to make these folks mad, but worst state ever until the 2020s. This is uh, how storm chasers view the United States. So most of the mid south here is in this category. Trees and trailers, get the drones, it's damage time. So in other words, you gotta wait for it to happen, then go out and look at it the next day. Uh, this right here uh, is this title, Bus, it's the Delta. And for Memphis, Shelby County, traffic and our locals are more dangerous than the storm. <laughs> so, <laughs> same, goes, same goes for Nashville. Um, so, the takeaway is there's no need to get out of your home QTH unless you want to go out in your car in the Delta and you've got enough sunlight, go out there and do it with the DMR capability. You will be able to get into one of the repeaters, but uh, those chances are pretty, pretty slim in the Mid-South most times of the year. So, what can you do? As an amateur radio operator, if you want to provide reports to the weather service and you don't want to leave your house, which we don't recommend, you just tell us what you see in your neighborhood. It doesn't have to be anything, you know, anything significant. It just be, you know, if you got a tree branch in your neighbor's yard that fell. Um, like I said earlier, winter weather—that's a big one. We 
If you've got a half inch of ice on the top of your fence, that's a big deal. We'd like to hear about it. So uh, scanner traffic, that's another one. If you, uh, especially if you're out in the you know, outer counties and you hear a deputy call in and say, we need a, we need a road barricade. A bit of, you know, DOT come out here and, and block this road because we got water over it. That's, a, that's something we'd like to hear about. So we do have some online spotter references. This is not the official online spotter training, but this is a multi-page document. It's basically our old Skyward presentation boiled down into a multi-page PDF of you know, lots of colored pictures. So uh, you can look at it at your own leisure and uh, learn that that way. So there's a tiny URL up there that you can uh, can type in or just take a picture of the QR code. And similarly, here's a, I always show on one page of this, this is a two page uh, spotter sheet. You don't want to look at a book, you just want to take it with you, keep it in your car, keep it in your shack, at home. It's like, okay, what do I need to report? What, you know, what should I be looking at? This is a, just a good two page resource. It's just a PDF. That's what I like. Just, just show me what I need to know right now. I can, I can scan it at a glance and, and see. It'll tell you what cloud features are important, what, what you know, it's not on the list and it's probably not, not worth recording. Okay, for those that don't want to uh, use social media uh, and you don't have your hand license, you don't have your radio, you can report uh, a storm report on our webpage. Uh, this is the front of the page here. It's, I don't have the URL up, I apologize. It's uh, weather.gov slash Memphis. Weather.gov slash Memphis. Once you're there, you can click on current hazards and then submit the storm report. What you take to this page here, there's a Google form embedded on that page. You do not have to leave your information if you don't want to, your, your name or and whatnot. But your location, what you saw. So weather.gov slash Memphis. You're one click away from submitting a storm report electronically. And I don't have it on the slide, but emptying. Uh, the emptying app, uh, it's in the Google Play Store, the Apple App Store. We do see those reports on our screens at the office. You can see those reports on Radar Scope as well. If you're interested in seeing other people's reports. So emptying, we've uh, we found pretty, pretty valuable as well. It's kind of a way you can just real quickly get in there and get back out. So this is the slide I had earlier. So I just want to challenge y'all, as a ham radio operator myself, I would like to encourage us to let's utilize this DMR technology that we have. It, it is very, very impressive. And as long as the infrastructure stays up, uh, even if it doesn't, if we've got power to the repeater and the internet's down, we, you know, we're going to have with the with the new repeater going up in Brunswick, we're going to have pretty good coverage around the metro area. So hopefully we don't run into a situation where the infrastructure is down like North Carolina, East Tennessee, because if that happens, then uh, you'll have your uh, HF privileges, right? So that's going to be, that's, you know, it's kind of hard for us to, you know, the CMR debts that we have every week, they're, you know, it's kind of hard to remember. Sometimes I get busy, but I feel like we need to practice these because you know sometimes something is going to happen to where we're going to, have to jump into action. We might be the last man standing as far as our communications capabilities. So it's kind of hard, human nature wise, to plan for something that's got an extremely low chance of happening. But if it does happen, the impact is huge. So I think I think that's kind of the uh, the uh, you know, the Aries, the, you know, that's just, that's just what we have to, kind of the mindset we have to remind ourselves of. We have a lot of capability uh, in our community. Uh, we do have a net control uh, the first of each month at 7 p.m. And we do need net control volunteers. And if you would like to do so, uh, see John Ryder, here in the room. As I said, you do not have to be in Memphis. I showed this slide at Oxford last week. That control operators can be pretty much anywhere. 
So that's all I have. Um, I, do remember, uh, I mentioned our, our web page as ham radio operators, as storm spotters. You're welcome to call this number. Just please don't share it with the general public. That number will ring to our operations floor 24 7. You need to here. So if you've got something to report and it's urgent, that 0401 number will get you a meteorologist. There is no phone menu tree, push this number to do this, you get right to the floor. So um, you got something that's urgent, you need to report it, call that number. At that point, we don't care how we get the information as long as we get it. All right, that's all I've got. Any yeah, where is that big dish that you showed at the beginning? Uh, that's in Millington. It's on the south side of the uh, Millington Airport. What's the elevation of that thing? Uh, 0.5 degrees. That's the lowest. And it'll scan up to 20. All right, everybody. Hopefully, everybody learned something, something to take out into the world. Uh, so, at this time, uh, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? Hey, can I make an announcement? Oh, yes, of course we can. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, y'all, I'm Mary Jean, KY4P, and I did forget to make this earlier, but uh, the Bluff City Blues ride is this Saturday. Uh, for the most part, the race or the ride, uh, I guess I should say, will be from about 7.30 in the morning until about 4.00. Uh, 4.30 give or take. So for one, if you're in the area, I'd encourage you to tune in uh, to the uh, 146.82 repeater. Hopefully you won't hear much of anything because if that's the case, that means we're having a great day, nobody's getting hurt. Uh, if they do have a lot of traffic, normally that's not a great sign, but uh, I will say we've had several people sign up. Uh, we've got all the stations covered. Uh, some of the stations have just one person though at the station. We got a couple mobile sags, uh, so supplying gear, but I will say, especially with all the stuff going on right now between the hurricanes, uh, whether it's in Tennessee, North Carolina, or down in Florida right now, uh, it's really important, you know, a lot of the reason why a lot of us are in this room is so we can be prepared for anything. Uh, and you can't get prepared just sitting there thinking about it or talking about it. You gotta get out and do it. And so uh, I would encourage you, uh, if any of y'all are interested in helping, it would be nice to have two people at each uh, station. Um, and then even if you are brand new and you don't have any experience and you just wanna come check it out, or even if you've been doing this for a while, just wanna come check it out, maybe test out your radios while you're out there, uh, come see me today um, and we can get you plugged in somewhere. Cause it is a lot of fun, they do, uh, uh, typically feed us well and then have some adult beverages at the end uh, if you're old enough for that. Uh, but it's a lot of fun and typically this is the one because it's a hundred miles uh, in Shelby County. It goes all the way up to Holly Grove right outside Covington, Tennessee. Uh, all the way over to Gilt Edge, Burleson, Randolph Landing. So I mean well, there's a lot of hills, a lot of area to cover. Uh, and I know, uh, you know, for the ones who have been in there uh, for some of the years where some things went wrong, uh, they really appreciate us being there to have their backs. So um, I'd encourage, let me, let me know if you want to help out. Why don't you get people that are going to work it to stand up so other people can see them? Yeah, and if you are, uh, I've emailed you guys, some of you guys, but we've got a couple here. I know a few weren't able to make it, but um, it is going to be exciting to see who all, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to it. We always have fun, but, you know, if you want to come help, come on. I have a question. Yes. Where do we meet and what time? So I'm going to send out an email tomorrow with all that extra detail. So uh, for the most part, though, it depends on the station. So uh, and that, that does a very great point. Depending on your time, if you have the full day off, we can get you somewhere uh, like maybe the start finish line or maybe uh, being a mobile SAG driver or one of the last stations to be open. Um, but we also have some stations that they're done at 10:15 or 11:30. So I mean, if you've got stuff going on in the afternoon, but you kind of want to come help for a little bit, we can get you in a station 
uh, that does end early. So depending on where you're at, um, often for this ride, because they're so stretched out, uh, what we kind of do is that we all kind of go out on our own. So like uh, start, uh, finish, and some of the earlier stations might have to be set up by around 7, uh, 7.30, give or take, which is when the first ride or the first flight starts. Uh, but then some of the stations that are much farther out up into Tipton County won't have to be at their spot until about 11, or not that late, uh, about 8.30, uh, 8.15 or 8.30. So um, depending on where you're at, there's kind of different times um, available. So if you do, if you are limited and you want to come help out, we can work with that. Uh, even if you wanted to assist somebody for a couple hours, we can work with that. So. <coughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Angie. All right. Oh, yes. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, no. All right. Thank you for being here. 7 3 to all.